Hello, Oscillator Sync here. This new little friend here is the MFX from ALM Busy Circuits. It is a 6U multi effect unit which allows you uh, CV control over pretty much all of the parameters in each of the effects. The effects are pretty wide ranging actually. They um, sort of slant towards delays and reverbs, which is fine with me because so do I, uh, but it also has um, a compressor, a distortion, it's got some bit reduction stuff, it's got some chorus type stuff, some panning. Uh, so yeah, um, a pretty wide ranging um, set of effects. And because it's digital, fingers crossed, uh, it gets new programs as time goes by as well. So before we dive into the video proper, I thought I would just do a really, really quick introduction to um, how the MFX operates, um, and in particular how you do the CV control. Um, if you want a sort of longer explanation of the module and a sort of a, a go through each of the different algorithms, ALM actually put out a really, really good video on release date, which is what prompted me to buy it, frankly. Um, uh, but yeah, I just thought I'd show uh, a couple of things on it just so that you're aware. So I've just got a synth voice set up here, which I will set going. Cool. Um, so we're on the home screen now as it, as it was, uh, and uh, from here we're able to uh, select different algorithms. We'll come back to this one in just a second. We're in bypass now, by the way, um, because one of the cool things about this is that we have a utilities menu here which contains a tuner. Very useful. Uh, I am not in tune, clearly. <laughs> not even close, about half a cent out. Terrible. Um, and also, rather wonderfully, a little scope, which I'm very pleased to have in my rack because um, getting a scope in, in your rack is very, very useful, but it's quite um, expensive, both in terms of, of money and uh, space in a lot of cases. So being able to have that as part of a, um, a module that I would otherwise be using just for sort of checking things is actually really, really nice. Anyway, we'll come back to the home screen. We'll go into this one here, currently in um, bypass, um, back and tap the knob to turn it on. So now we can hear uh, that we are hearing the effect. I hope you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, and we have lots of different parameters in here um, for doing various different things, um, different modes. different programs within the modes. That's quite nice. Um, and then various parameters for doing other stuff. So feedback there. Lovely. Let's make it bigger. Um, and if we want to uh, assign CV controls or anything, if you've used... Um, uh, Pamela's new workout, it's very, very similar to that, except we've got three CVNs instead. If you go all the way back down a parameter, so this is the high cut. Here we're getting darker. That's lovely, isn't it? Lovely dark ambience on it. Um, yeah. If we go all the way down to the bottom of our parameter, we get access to CV1, 2, and 3 as um, as our controllers for this. So you can, uh, you can only have one CV input going to each parameter, but that same CV input can go to multiple parameters. And as we'll see, we're able to actually customize how that CV input is treated. Um, so I'll grab a LFO from over on uh, stages. Plug it into CV1. And uh, get that, turn that actually into a CV, would be useful. And you should be able to see here, we've now got this bar graph going up and down here. And you can hear that. Like it's been modulated, right? Slow that down a bit. 
So if we want to um, customize how this works, we can hold down the button again, and it gives us these two additional um, options here, which is attenuation and uh, offset. So um, probably best to talk about offset first. So this allows us to apply a um, an offset to the voltage that's coming in. And again, this is on a per parameter basis. This isn't for this input, it's for this input on this parameter. So what I like to do usually is uh, unplug my modulation and find the, the start point for my modulation. It's probably about there, isn't it? Don't want it any darker than that. Then we can plug in our modulation. Maybe we just want to attenuate that a little bit so it doesn't get right to the top brightness. There we go, and now we've got CV control, which is customized over that um, particular parameter. And if we just long hold to come out of here, we could choose another parameter like the low cut and do a similar thing. Grab another LFO. slower we certainly don't want it to go all the way to the top there so we probably want our offset to be zero so that it can be um, as open as possible we'll attenuate it quite a bit now we've essentially got a high and low pass filter on our reverb which we can modulate individually. Which is certainly a cool, cool sound. Yeah, so um, very customizable. Pretty much every single parameter is able to be CV controlled. Um, yeah, um, which, is, which is a lovely thing to have. As I say, the range of sounds tend towards the reverb and delay side of things, but not necessarily sort of standard reverbs and delays in, in a lot of cases. And most of them have a little twist to them. Yeah. Cool. So with such a wide range of effects available and with uh, so much control over the parameters uh, within them, um, the FX can do a wide range of sounds, some of which can be uh, really nice and some of which can be really dirty and nasty. Um, but today, uh, what I want to do in this video is share with you three patches that I've been playing with um, where I think the MFX sounds nice, lovely, possibly even beautiful. Um, and maybe in another video, uh, not so long from now, I will uh, share some of the more aggressive, shall we say, sounds that the MFX is capable of doing. Um, but uh, let's jump in to the first lovely patch. So this is the first patch I've come up with here, and this is using the um, PCM delay mode on the MFX, which has a particular property to it, which uh, allows you to do this particular trick that I'm using in this uh, patch here. Um, and we'll disassemble the patch in just a second, but as this is kind of a generative type affair, let's just um, let it sit for a, a moment or two more just to see if it does anything else particularly pretty. So um, let's, um, just for the moment, let's just take MFX out of the um, equation here and also let's just take down that reverb that I've got going on here as well. So we'll just bypass MFX for a second. 
by pressing those two things together. Uh, and let's just listen to what the raw sound is, and we'll just quickly talk about what that is for your information. So this is the raw sound that's going into the effects. Uh, the voice here, if you like, is um, just the 2HP VCO. Um, the uh, triangle output on that, which is going into the top of um, the Takab 2 low pass gate here. Uh, and it's going through both channels of it, so they, they normal together if you don't patch anything else in. So it's going through two low pass gates, which just allows it to get a bit sort of darker and shorter decay if you're um, just sort of plucking it. And uh, that's just going straight into the MFX. So that's the um, uh, the voice. In terms of the uh, sequencing that's going on here, um, the pitch information is actually coming from stages. So this is running the alternative keymem firmware. And all I've got here is uh, an LFO, uh, which I think is just a like a sawtooth LFO going slowly on uh, channel five of stages. That's then going out of channel five and into channel six. And channel six, when you feed it a uh, level in this way, um, basically becomes like a sample and hold. And in the keymem firmware, I can also quantize this. So it's just like a um, descending wave that's going into a sample and hold, and then it's being quantized to a pentatonic scale, I think. And I can adjust the range of that using the sliders and the knob there. Uh, what's triggering the sample and hold is um, PAMS here on uh, output 8, which is actually just a straight up um, clock, I think. The reason it sounds like it's got some additional sort of gaps and sequencing in it is that I am running a uh, just a really slow LFO out of stages on channel one of stages into PAMS, and that is adjusting the um, multiplier for the clock on output 8. So everything sort of stays to clock. Um, but the um, sort of the, the density of the note events um, sort of alter as that LFO sweeps up and down, and that's just a triangle, I think. There, um, so that's what's um, triggering the sample and the hold, which is giving us our pitches, and that's also uh, we're just molting off there with the stack cable. What's going into my low pass gate to ping it? Um, yeah, so that is the sequencing and the voice that we've got there. So let's um, bring. MFX back in. Now the main thing you'll probably be able to hear there, a great example of it there, is that the um, the apparent pitch of the DK on the delay is shifting around. So we're getting these sort of euphoric bursts like that one there of higher pitched trills. And then sometimes it also drops down, so we get like these sort of slightly furry low-end rumble delays, which are actually like an octave below, or even more than an octave below. So what's going on here? Well, if we come into the... Um, uh, when it's on um, ping-pong mode, uh, which is why we're getting that stereo movement, and I'm also clocking the delay uh, just with uh, one of my outputs. Yeah, just output one on PAMS there, so it's, uh, the, the delay time is being um, kept in time with the sequence, or rather the, the main clock of the sequence. So um, what we have here on, um, on this uh, mode on MFX is this bandwidth control. And at the moment this is being controlled by um, CV1, which is just coming from a random uh, random LFO on stages, and you can see it jumping up and down there, like that. But if we take that away from being CV control just for a second. Uh, so the bandwidth control changes the sample rate of the delay, basically. And um, this is kind of replicating some of those old sort of digital delays, where in order to get longer delay times, uh, the sort of primitive uh, digital hardware needed to reduce its sample rate in order to, to, to get more delay time. And what you get with that um, 
reduce reduction of sample rate is that kind of uh, sort of fairy anal alias kind of digital glisten which I do adore <laughs> very nice and you can hear now that that is running uh, quite a lot faster than it was up here you will also have just noticed that you heard that pitch shifting happening so what happens on the MFX when you change the bandwidth is that anything that is in the delay buffer gets stretched out or compressed so if we go from a high uh, sample rate or bandwidth here and drop down you can hear there that our delays sort of halved in pitch they got twice as long and they halved in pitch if we go the other way what was in the uh, buffer at the time gets compressed sped up by twice and the delay halves in time so by moving this control around with some CV, which we can do of course here, we get this constantly evolving, uh, sort of always pitch related changes to our delay symbol, that uh, signal rather. And I think that's rather lovely. <laughs> So the other thing that I'm controlling with CV, because you can see we've got two CV ends here, is um, here on the high cut. So the high cut is, as you'd expect, it's a, it's a high cut. It's a, essentially a, a, a low pass filter. And I'm just moving this around and this applies to just the delay signal. And it just adds a little bit more movement in the timbre of the, um, the, the delay. Um, it also means that in some cases that sort of um, extreme glisten sort of so it kind of disappeared there for a bit and then it has come back with a vengeance there as the filter is basically opened back up and again this has just been controlled by uh, a random LFO on stages so there's not a lot actually going on in here but you get a lot for your for two channels of CV, you're getting a, a lot of uh, movement here, and the fact that we've clocked it to the sequence also means that, along with these sort of pitch movements, everything seems to stay somewhat abstract but musical. The um, the sample rates um, essentially half each time, so which is why we get the um, the octave uh, effect going on here. Uh, the other thing that we could be playing with potentially um, a couple of things actually. Um, we, it's lovely. Uh, so we've got the bit depth, which is um, the bit depth of the delay. So I've got it set at 12, which is just ever so slightly furrier, just because I just like the way it sounded. A bit more hi-fi with 16-bit. You can hear there that everything sort of... Dy the dynamics of the delay signal is a little bit more clear, perhaps. It's 12 where we had it. Everything's a little bit more sort of smeared. Uh, in terms of the, the, the dynamics, it's a slightly more compressed sounding, perhaps. Um, there's a Moolor one here, which gets really fluffy, but not like harsh. And in the right setting, I think having that sort of noise integrated with the delay signal could be a really, really beautiful thing. Don't know whether it serves it that well on this patch. I don't know, maybe. Maybe if we could filter this afterwards, that might that might do the trick. Still nice. Of eight bit, which uh, you can hear like definite sort of bit crushing type artifacts going on in there. Which again, I don't mind. And in the right context, I think could be really really nice. All the way down to four bit which is probably a bit much for this patch. <laughs> really square wave uh, delay signals. But you could see how you could take certain like lead lines, not in the context of this patch perhaps, but you could see how you might take certain like lead lines and use that to generate like a, like a square wave um, harmony part to something perhaps, especially if you kept the, the movement of the sample rate as well. That could be really cool. Just like 12 bit, a little bit compressed and, and fuzzy. 
Yeah. Um, and then the only other thing I, I did was I malted uh, that uh, signal uh, and sent it into uh, Disting, which is uh, on a reverb setting. And I can just mix that in now. It's not 100% wet. Just mix it on my mixer. And let's just sort of... Finishes the, the patch off nicely, I think. Sort of like a self harmonizing generative ambient cluster of pleasant bloops. It's the kind of patch that you would kind of set up and just sort of leave on in the background, I think. It's just a, just a nice one to have going on. And we can, if we wanted to, adjust the range of our... Our notes, we could do that on stages. We're just adjusting those two controls. And also we could change how much the notes change by changing the rate of that LFO. Get something a bit more regular. More obviously descending. Yeah. Nice patch. Even if I do say so myself. Right. What's next? So this second batch here is based on the Almacon reverb mode, which is, um, I believe, modelled on high-end 80s digital reverb. And the idea with this patch is to not do anything like super flashy, but um, modulate the parameters of the reverb in such a way that the space and the sound source's position in that space is constantly sort of moving and evolving. So we might have it very far away in a big room. The room might get brighter. And we might get even further away. And even further away in an even bigger room. And that space is constantly sort of just moving, just subtly not not often like in big jumps or anything and it just creates for an interesting ambience where this particular sound source is never really stationary much smaller room so um let's um hear it without uh, mfx for a second Oops. Uh, okay so, uh, this is the sound source as is, so that's Rings, and uh, Rings has been sequenced in terms of the vaults per octave uh, just by um, PAMS doing a quantized random. Uh, in terms of the sound that's coming into Rings to be um, resonated, uh, that is uh, just the noise from Kinks. Uh, which is going into uh, the adactual filter here, which is then going into a VCA. And the VCA is held ever so slightly open, so there's always a little bit of just rumble happening in there. Um, the VCA and the filter are both being opened uh, by stages, and it's uh, uh, the segment made up by these two um, uh, segments here, which is uh, just a straight up attack decay. But you can hear that the length of the attack is being modulated. Sometimes it's very slow like that, but sometimes it's a lot, a lot faster. And that's because um, I'm self-patching uh, stages just from this first random segment into um, the attack portion of uh, this envelope. So that's a much faster sort of, um, still bowed sound, but uh, much faster. But sometimes it's a slower, uh, by way of sound instead. So that's 
all there is going on in the source. Um, and then the output of uh, rings is going into a channel of quadrat just to take a little bit of the volume off. Uh, rings is an especially hot module in certain situations, and I was just finding that I was clipping uh, the MFX in some cases. So uh, let's bring the reverb back in. So uh, what are we going to do, be doing here? Um, so basically there are three random um, channels of stages. By random I mean they're doing random movement, not that they are <laughs> picked haphazardly. Um, and they're all going into quadrat. Again, just taking a bit off the CV, um, stages swings from zero up to um, uh, eight volts, which is, again, um, for some modules unusually hot and what I was finding with MFX is if I gave it the full swing of voltage from stages it was actually clipping the top of the CV which meant that um, any movement was um, spending more time at the top uh, rather than moving so I've just taken well, about half of it off so they're swinging about four volts instead which seemed to work a lot better and then uh, all I'm doing is I am modulating the mix amount which obviously is going to set us forwards and back in the space that's quite low at the moment. And we can hear that the main sound is quite present. Uh, and if we wait, hopefully we're going to get some movement. I've got this one moving the slowest, I think. Just speed it up. Let's try, I think. This one. So you can hear now that the mix is a bit higher, we sound a bit further away. And I'm doing similar things here for um, the, uh, the size I've got set um, in the same place. Damping, which is how much of the top end is being lost in the feedback loop of the reverb. So when this goes high, it will sound like a darker, less reverberant room. So now it's gone down, it got very bright and very long. Now it's going up, down again, uh, so long reverberant. And when it goes high, it kind of kills a lot of what's going on inside the reverb as well. So I'm not setting that one too high. I've got that attenuated slightly more. And um, what else have we got? Uh, diffusion is the other one, which is going to affect the density of the uh, reverb trails as well. And again, similar idea. Um, we're just changing the character of the reverb as time goes by, which gives us this movement in space, um, perceived movement in space without having to do any like, um, panning or anything. And it's been really nice to discover that you can get some really interesting, subtle variations uh, to uh, reverbs like this. I think sending more stuff through a reverb like this, if it was a background element in a track, would be a really, really interesting way of um, putting a subtle amount of movement in that um, background element without it being like super sort of higher. I'm being modulated a lot, which is cool as well sometimes. But I just quite like the way this is sort of moving things subtly backwards and forwards in the mix. Okay. Let's do one more, shall we? Okay, so uh, this patch is maybe a little bit more um, frenetic than some of the previous ones. Um, uh, certainly a lot more going on. Um, but uh, there's something quite lovely about the additional sort of harmonies and melodies which have been automatically created. And um, that's all been done, believe it or not, by using the uh, data corruptor. Um, mode on the MFX, which 
from a distance it looks like it's probably some kind of um, bit crusher type uh, mode which it you know it, it does do it does sample rate reduction and bit depth reduction but on top of that it um, kind of emulates a uh, it's described as a malfunctioning digital device where the uh, the data that's in the buffer kind of gets glitched there and just keeps sort of repeating itself um, and we can use that to sort of create these sort of delayed um, kind of uh, repeating textures alongside our main uh, part so let's um, deconstruct this a little bit so we can hear what's going on so let's get rid of MFX just for a second and let's get rid of the reverb. So um, the main voice in this case is uh, Beehive, which is uh, Platt's uh, clone uh, in the uh, wavetable mode, I think. And uh, I'm sequencing it in much the same way as I did on the first example, which is just with uh, an LFO and um, a sample and, sample and hold on on stages and um, just doing some modulation of the uh, timbre morph and harmonics harm rather knob uh, which is variously coming from stages and also there's a stepped one I think coming from uh, yeah stepped one coming from pams there uh, that's going out uh, here going into a malt and um, the version that we're hearing now goes into uh, the low pass gate and then just out into X pan. So if I wanted to, I could pan things around. Perhaps we'll uh, play with that to see how we can hear the sort of complementing sounds. So the other side of uh, the malt here is going into MFX, which is what is um, feeding the uh, data corruptor uh, mode here. Sorry, bit corruptor, not data corruptor. Um, so let's have a listen to what that is doing. So I'll just turn that down. So um, this is um, being fed out into a uh, filter here just to take a little bit of the top end off. If we wanted to, we could just hear that on its own perhaps. So this is the uh, raw sound here. And you can hear that it's kind of grabbing onto stuff from our source material. And it's sort of again, it's stuck in a buffer and repeating it. And it's sort of jumping to different parts of the buffer as it's doing it. So the Buffer size here is being defined by a clock coming from PAMS. Uh, yep. Um, and we're able to uh, use the clock to define the buffer size, which is going to make sure that our sort of um, notes, if you like, are changing in time with our main clock. Uh, but what I'm doing is I've got this set to skip occasionally, so the buffer keeps sort of jumping to sort of double and half the size, which just gives us some nice variation there. So that's going into um, a filter just to take some of the top end off it. And then out into a low pass gate, which I'm then just pinging again with PAMS. Uh, I think just with a, a skip and a rapid gate there. And going into XPAN, where I'm also panning it around automatically. Uh, yeah, using PAMS again. Just a stepped pan pattern, I think. So, um... You can hear that it's sort of doing lots of things which are musically related. Because of the scale that I've chosen here. Everything also always sorts of um, harmonizes nicely. But with some really nice sort of interesting glitchy gritty occasionally sounds in here. So uh, uh, what you'll 
appeal to here is that the timbre, uh, although obviously we are shifting the timbre around on Platts, is not going to be the same all the time. And that's because I am uh, CV controlling the sample rate for the uh, bit crusher part of the bit corruptor, which again I think is just coming from yeah, just a random um, channel on stages there. Uh, and that sample rate reduction doesn't apply to the current output, it applies to the current input. So um, it's not going to affect the, re the repeats that are already in the buffer, it's just going to affect new ones that make their way in. Uh, which means that we don't just constantly get this shifting uh, sample rate reduction curve thing happening. The sample reduced, there we go, the sample rate reduced uh, stuff sort of just makes its way into the sound, which is really, really cool. Um, and quite different to just sort of sweeping a sample rate reduction thing. In terms of um, how things are getting uh, repeated, there's a um, control for repeat risk and uh, glitch risk. Uh, glitch risk is the thing that, that sets the repeats going, and then repeat risk is... Um, I believe whether or not the repetitions are going to change and I've just got them both on full um, and I've got the mix for this on full as well. Uh, we can also reverse the glitches Oops. but it's only going to reverse the, the new ones I think. Yeah, so we're starting to get some reversed ones in there. That might be fun to have on CV control actually and just have that just switching occasionally. Uh, and there's also this lock in control which will lock what's currently in the buffer. So we could use that for just grabbing. So if we wanted to have more control over where this um, actually um, changed to a new thing, if we wanted to have it over like four bars or something, we could set up a gate with um, sort of 99% width coming out of PAMS and just let the new buffer come in at the end of each four bars. That might be a nice way if we wanted to have something that's a bit more controlled, but I personally like the chaos. Uh, and then uh, that's all getting mixed together in X-Pan and then going into testing for some reverb. One thing that might be interesting is if we kill that panning, just put the raw one right and the repeated one left. So we've kind of got two different parts going on here. And we're kind of generating this new voice that's uh, musically related um, from uh, the first voice without the need for a second voice. And as long as you're dealing with a, um, a scale that's going to sound good against itself, so I think it's just set to pentatonic at the moment, so those notes are always going to sound good next to each other. Um, you've got a way of creating an entirely new voice that's based off the first one which is kind of similar to what we're doing in the first patch as well, uh, but slightly more sort of frenetic pace to it. Let's maybe just see how it sounds like if we turn the tempo down a bit. Let's take a minute for the buffer to... nice as well. A little bit less uh, aggressive. Let me put some slop on the timing. So, 
Um, although at a distance, this thing sort of uh, the, the bit corruptor mode sort of looks like a, an angry, aggressive bit crusher friend. We can use it to almost generate an entirely new voice. You can use it for sort of gentle down sampling type stuff if you want to get like an old school sampler feel as well. Um, and maybe mix in just a little bit of the glitch on a sample might be really, really cool. Uh, but this is one way you could use it for an entirely new uh, voice essentially. Do you know what? I prefer it without the panning. Yeah. So um, there are three patches using MFX to do pretty things. Having CV control over all of the effects parameters is kind of magic, um, especially in things like the, the PCM uh, delay, as I showed in the first example. So I think I'm going to have a lot of fun with this. Um, it helps that it also sounds good. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, if you uh, enjoy this video, if you found it interesting, then as always, if you find a moment to leave me a like on the video, that's always massively appreciated. And make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any upcoming synth fun. But other than that, until next time, I will um, see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.